Amen. It's one of my favorites. Thank you, Marshall. Let us pray. <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit. Move among us. Touch our hearts with the words about Jesus that we will hear today. Help us to feel your presence, to know your power, to be assured of our salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and to be empowered by you to live our faith in this world that others might also know the blessed assurance that he is theirs. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. Even though the election is still over a year away, many candidates have begun to campaign, as you know. They're hoping to be elected president of the United States of America in 2016. Now, at this point, there are many candidates, but a few seem to get most of the media attention. And media attention is what the candidates are hoping for in order to get their name and their plan for leadership out to as many voters as possible. However, it seems to me that sometimes the words of the candidates are taken out of context and sensationalized by some reporters in order to make a more interesting news story. And as we get closer to the election, the candidates themselves will probably also begin to take what other candidates say out of context and use those words against their opponents. I, for one, do not really look forward to the TV ads that are likely to be part of the campaign as we get closer to election time. Negative campaigning seems to be a part of our current culture. Or has it always been that way? In today's scripture lesson, we will read about how a speaker's words were taken out of context, turned around and used against him by what could be considered a political party all the way back in Bible times. The speaker I am talking about was Stephen, a man chosen by his peers, along with six others, for the task of distributing food to those in need as a part of the ministry of the early church. We read about how Stephen and these others were chosen for this ministry in our scripture passage a few weeks ago. Of the seven chosen, Stephen's name was listed first, and in that passage it was noted that Stephen was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. We also read in that passage that once the church had chosen these seven men for the food distribution ministry, the apostles prayed and laid hands on them, confirming their selection as servant leaders for the church. And as is often the case, when someone answers the call to serve in one ministry of the church, that person will soon find God empowering him or her for other areas of ministry as well. And this seems to be what happened with Stephen. So let's pick up the story with the next scripture reading in Acts to find out how God began to use Stephen as a witness for Jesus beyond distributing food to the needy. Our reading for today is found in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. This is part of a larger story. We'll take us a few weeks to get through it, but we'll start with these Verses Acts 6, 8 through 15. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And the, all those who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face 
was like the face of an angel. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So after the apostles laid hands and prayed that Stephen would be used by God, Stephen began to not only distribute food to the needy, but also to preach the gospel and to perform great wonders and signs among the people. In other words, the Holy Spirit empowered Stephen for a ministry similar to that of the apostles. And since we know from his name that Stephen was a probably a Greek-speaking Jew, as were the others who were chosen to distribute the food to the needy, it makes sense that Stephen focused his ministry to other Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem. The synagogue of the freedmen would have been a place where Greek-speaking Jews would have gathered. You see, uh, freedmen were former slaves or the children of former slaves who had been set free by their owners. Many Jews had been taken captive to Rome at the time of Pompey's conquest of Judea in 63 BC and then were later set free. While they were slaves, they began to speak Greek, which was the language of their captors. Years later, after they were set free, some of these freed slaves or their children returned to their homeland, Judea, including some to Jerusalem. And they joined with other freed slaves who spoke Greek to set up a synagogue of, of those who had shared this common background of having been taken as slaves away from Jerusalem and then after they were released, having returned to Jerusalem. So in order for us to understand why there was such a backlash to what Stephen said to those in the freedmen's synagogue, we must realize that for Jews of this time, there were four key symbols of their religion that they, hold, that they held very dear and close to their heart. The first was the temple. The second was the law of Moses. Then the, there was the Holy Land, especially Jerusalem, where the temple was located. And number four, the ethnic identity of Jews. These were the things that set Jews apart from the people around them. These were the things that identified Jews as God's people. These were the things that all loyal Jews held as signs that they were God's chosen people. These were the things with which these Jews would not compromise. Evidently, when Stephen proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah and that being faithful to God was more about believing in and obeying Jesus than about keeping the law of Moses and obeying the worship rituals of the temple, the Jews in the synagogue were outraged. They passionately believed that the law of Moses and the temple were among the most important aspects of their ethnic and religious identity. And this may have been even more true for those who had for a time been forced to live far away from Jerusalem, but who had returned because of their strong feeling of connection with the temple and the religion that it represented. And so these freedmen Jews began to argue with Stephen because they felt that Stephen was speaking against the things that were most sacred to them and in their understanding most sacred to God. But with the Holy Spirit empowering Stephen's words, they could not win a debate with Stephen. Now, Luke does not tell us the exact topic of the debate, but we know that it had to do with the identity of Jesus, whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. And if so, what being the Messiah meant for God's people, the Jews. What Stephen said about the implications of Jesus being the Messiah so upset these Jews that since they could not win a debate with Stephen, they secretly found some men to accuse Stephen of blasphemy against Moses and God. In other words, like the political strategists of today, they found a way to take Stephen's words out of context, turn them around, and use them against him. And then they used this negative campaign claiming that Stephen was speaking against the things most sacred to the Jewish people to stir up the people and the religious leaders against Stephen. And they brought Stephen before the Jewish ruling council in the temple, the same council that have flogged the apostles and warned them not to speak about Jesus anymore. 
false witnesses reported to the council that Stephen was constantly speaking against the temple and the law of Moses. They claimed that Stephen had said that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy the temple and would change the customs that Moses had given to them. Since Luke identifies them as false witnesses, we know that they, what they claimed that Stephen said were not the things that he had really said. They took Stephen's words out of context, twisted them around, and used them against him. However, according to the gospel writers, including Luke, Jesus did predict that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed, which did come true. And empowered by the Holy Spirit, Stephen spoke about the things that Jesus had said and done. And the things that Jesus had said and done that got Jesus crucified were the same things that got Stephen arrested and brought before this same council. Now Luke does not tell us if Stephen came to faith as a result of hearing and seeing Jesus himself, or if it was the apostles' preaching that led Stephen to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. But it is obvious that Stephen was fully converted. He was absolutely certain that Jesus is the Messiah and that what Jesus had said was true, was the truth. And Stephen was so passionate about his faith that when he spoke about Jesus, those who disagreed with him felt so challenged by his words that they responded to Stephen just as those who were challenged by Jesus responded to Jesus. They found false witnesses to testify against Stephen and brought him before the religious leaders for trial. And though Luke tells us that those who testified against Stephen were false witnesses, there surely was some truth to what they said. After all, if Stephen was preaching that Jesus is the Messiah and that salvation is found only through faith in Jesus, then that implies that Jesus did, in fact, replace the temple as a place where God's people are to come to be reconciled to God and to receive forgiveness for their sins. You see, for the Jews, the temple was the dwelling place of God. The temple was the place where they came to offer their animal sacrifices in order to atone for their sins so that they could be forgiven. But the message that Stephen was preaching was that Jesus' death on the cross was the atonement for all of our sins. And that believing in and following Jesus is the way to be reconciled to God. And so in a sense, it is true that Stephen was saying things against the temple and against the law of Moses, which set up the sacrificial system. Of course, it's clear to us, far, far removed from this situation, that the problem was not that Stephen was speaking as, against the temple, and the law of Moses. The problem was that Stephen's opponents and Jesus' opponents rejected God's Messiah, God's own son, Jesus, as the fulfillment of the temple and the law of Moses. The problem was that these religious Jews were more devoted to the temple and the law of Moses than they were to God who gave them the temple and the law of Moses as signs of his presence until he sent Jesus. Now, if they had truly wanted to know God and to live as his faithful people, then they would have recognized God's coming in Jesus of Nazareth, God's own son. The thing about Stephen was that he was totally convinced that Jesus is who Jesus claimed to be and who the apostles said Jesus was and who I believe Jesus is still today. Stephen was convinced that Jesus is the Messiah the one sent from God to save us from our sin. And for Stephen, his faith in Jesus was the most important thing in life. More important than the law of Moses, more important than the temple. Jesus was the most important thing. See, Stephen did not simply add Jesus on to the other things that were important to him. Stephen's faith in Jesus became everything to him. Stephen put everything else aside and opened himself to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was so filled with the Holy Spirit that even his opponents saw it on his face as he stood on trial before them. Now, the real question of Stephen's trial was, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who is Jesus of Nazareth? The Jewish religious leaders and many of the Jewish people answered this question this way. Jesus of Nazareth was a blasphemer. A blasphemer is one who treats God or sacred things disrespectfully through their words or their actions. 
Jesus claimed to know God more intimately than the religious leaders knew God. Jesus claimed to know how to interpret God's will more faithfully than the experts in the law of Moses. Jesus claimed that he was God's faithful representative, God's son, who came to make it possible for all people to know and to follow God faithfully. The Jews who rejected Jesus said that what Jesus claimed was not true, that Jesus was a liar, and that those like Stephen who followed Jesus were blasphemers too. So who is Jesus of Nazareth? Stephen answered this question by saying that Jesus is the Messiah that God promised would save his people. Jesus is the one sent by God to reveal God to the world. Stephen said Jesus is the one who died on the cross to atone for all of our sins. Jesus died once, so there is no need for any more animal sacrifices in the temple. Stephen said Jesus is the one who God raised from the dead, proving Jesus is who Jesus said he was. Jesus is the one who ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, interceding for us even right now. And through faith in Jesus, we can have everlasting life and the gift of the Holy Spirit who will empower us to live as faithful followers of Jesus. So who is Jesus of Nazareth? How do you answer this question? It looks like a pretty simple question, and yet it is the most important question that any of us will ever answer. Because our answer to this question affects everything else in our life, both now and forevermore, eternally. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? I invite you to answer this question today. And I invite you to follow Stephen's example by opening yourself to the Holy Spirit to so fill you that others will see in you one who knows God intimately and who follows Jesus faithfully. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for faithful witnesses like Stephen who were willing to speak the truth even though others disagreed who are willing to put you first, to live, to be a witness of who you are, that others might know, that we ourselves might know. Because if there had not been faithful witnesses like Stephen back then, and every generation since, if there had not been faithful witnesses from Stephen's time until today, we would not know. We would not have that blessed assurance. So we thank you for Stephen and all of the others like him through the ages who have stood up and said, this is the truth. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is from God. Jesus died for our sins and God raised him from the dead. And it is only through faith in Jesus that we can have everlasting life. Help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses that those who come after us will also know who you are. We pray in Jesus' mighty name.